From our studios at the corner of 8th and Walton in Bentonville, Arkansas, welcome to Saturday Morning Meeting, brought to you in part by Dun & Bradstreet Credibility Corp. Saturday Morning Meeting covers Walmart, Sam's Club, and the consumer product companies that are represented on the racks and shelves throughout the country and around the world. I'm Derek Reidenauer, and our focus is on the insights, trends, and best practices to help you as a supplier grow your business with the world's largest retailer. Thank you for joining us. And coming up today, I'll be talking with Teresa Warren from 8th and Walton about supplier scorecards and reviewing this week's top news stories with me are Jeff Amarine and Andy Shook. But first, the headlines. Walmart CFO Charles Hawley credits better weather for an increase in sales. This winter's brutal weather has taken a toll on retail, but shoppers have returned to stores as the days have gotten longer. Reuters reports that Hawley recently spoke at an investors conference in which he noted that sales have been very good over the past few weeks. Retail Wire recently asked its readers to discuss Costco's youth problem. While the retailer has a positive public image, millennials just aren't shopping there. For one thing, most young people don't have the need or the space for bulk purchases. Another issue is Costco's lack of a significant e-commerce site. And while Costco isn't specifically targeting young adults, it has increased its organic offerings in hopes of attracting younger customers. Grocery giants Albertsons and Safeway recently announced merger plans, according to CNN Money. The merger will not result in store closings, although the organization will still be smaller than Kroger. Albertsons CEO Bob Miller will assume the role of executive chairman. Safeway's Robert Edwards will remain president and CEO of the organization after the merger. Twin Cities Business reports that a recent Kantar retail study shows that shopping at Walmart is still a better deal than shopping at Target, unless you have a Target credit card. The average savings at Walmart is 3.8% over Target's prices. However, individuals who shop with the Target red card automatically get a 5% discount, making their baskets slightly cheaper than Walmart. The price discrepancy between the two retailers has increased since June of 2013. Then a similar study indicated that Walmart shoppers were saving only about 2% over Target's prices, comparing to the 3.8% savings today. While genetically engineered salmon isn't even available to the public yet, some retailers have already issued a ban against it. Bloomberg Business reports that several retailers, including Kroger, Safeway, Target, and Trader Joe's, have pledged not to sell biotech salmon in their stores. Now the industry is waiting to find out whether Walmart will make the same decision. And finally, a bit of local news. Arkansas Business reports that the Walmart Foundation donated $1.5 million to Amazium, the interactive museum currently being built in Bentonville. The donation allows Amazium to build a temporary gallery to house traveling exhibits, which means exhibits can be changed more frequently and reflect the hot topics of the moment. The donation also gives the Walmart Foundation the right to name the gallery. Check out Walmart and Supplier News as is reported on walmartnewsnow.com. And we're joined now by our panel, Jeff Amarin from the University of Arkansas uh, Technology Ventures and Andy Shook from Shook Up Sales. Welcome, guys. I want to get things started with the Albertson Safeway merger. Last week we had a chance to talk, and Kroger was kind of the lead suitor when we did our taping. Obviously now Albertson has come out. Jeff, what's your take on this? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think that it's, it's a, uh, an approach to try to gain scale and build additional mm -hmm. economies as they try to compete against the larger players, Walmart and others. It'll be interesting to see how it pans out. And Andy? No, I, I agree. Um, you know, as Walmart's been the leader for how many years now? I mean, since 2003, 2004. Several years. That they, yeah, it's and, and there's a difference here because these, these stores are strictly grocery chains. They don't do the super centers. So when we right. talk about Kroger being the number one grocery chain, this merger would make them the number two. Walmart's still largest in terms of scale and stores and super centers. But right. But, but, they're, but still, Walmart's grocery is still the largest in the country. Right. So, I mean, with, with, that, with that said, these others have to catch up to them at some point in time. And by going out and merging, bringing in others into their, into their fold, I mean, you're going to start seeing that happen. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's obviously, for the most part, a commodity business. And so efficient supply chains are one of the only ways you can really manage that margin compression. And I think that's something they got to do. So what do you see as the impact on some of the regional players? I mean, we have Harps that's, that's local here, 60, 675 store chain. Do we see, do you think that we would see those possibly be gobbled up in the future by some of these companies? See, I don't I don't think so. I mean, I think they kind of serve a niche within a certain area. Okay. And I I don't really see I don't see that there's an advantage in going into some of those markets for some of these larger 
and, and a lot of those, a lot, it seems like a lot of those regional chains have strong local following. They maybe yeah. specialize in, in something, one or two different things that okay. are going to continue to draw the people in. Uh, another thing that has kind of come out of this acquisition is the kind of re revelation, I guess, for, for some people that Kroger and Albertson Safeway also do manufacturing. So does this put Walmart behind, uh, or kind of in, should Walmart be concerned because you've got some vertical integration going on with these, these two companies now that are going to be really on Walmart's heels? Well, I would say, the thing that's interesting to me is it depends a lot on what that product mix is. If you've got a bunch of capital investment in vertical integration on products where you're going to face price compression and they're going to be highly competitive, I'm not sure that's an advantage to have cost in that. Well, and you, and you wonder, I mean, Walmart's never stepped into that. Right. You know, they, they've been a house of brands from the beginning. They talk about being a house of brands. They have some private label offerings, um, but usually they have other suppliers. Well, they do have other suppliers that are making right. it for them because they don't make it for themselves. So, you know, they've never stepped down that path. And you wonder, you know, with Safeway and Albertsons coming together with more of those, with Kroger, obviously integrated with those, is that going to be a competitive advantage for them? Or is Walmart playing it right with the direction that they're going? You know, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out because Walmart's not a big player within private label. They have a big private label line, but not like some of these others. Right. It does kind of seem like you're more agile if you're doing private label and someone else owns the means of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Then if the, the, those products don't have uh, don't have a good following or they fall off out of fall out of favor, then maybe you can. Move more quickly. Well, there's a reduction of liability as well. Exactly. Yeah. That. Yeah. Okay, so it'll be interesting to see how this turns out. There's still a 21 day shop around period that uh, Safeway has a chance to do, which may allow Kroger to pick up some of the stores on the East Coast. Good win for them? Or is this something you think you think this is all done? Well, I don't know. It's never done until it's done. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's right? true. In, in the area of private equity, those guys are wheeling and dealing until the last minute. So yeah. there's always another backup plan or another play. Yeah. It's not right. done until it's completely done. We'll see how it, how it all shakes yeah. out and what this happens. Let me move on to another topic. Um, salmon, uh, there was, uh, we did a story earlier about uh, many grocery chains are backing away from the GMO salmon, mm -hmm. the biotech salmon. Uh, obviously, if you're an Alaska fisher, fisher person or fisherman, you're very happy about this, which I know Walmart has kind of struggled with. Jeff, what's your take on this? W well, it's, it's oftentimes important, I think, to separate good science and what can actually be done with genetic modification, selective breeding, and all those sorts of things versus the sort of hysteria that follows the no GMO movement. There's real benefit in having a differentiated segment that is all natural and organic and, and uh, uh, fresh caught versus farm raised. But by the same token, I think a lot of it is just marketing differentiation versus any kind of real scientific concern. It's my own personal opinion on it. Well, and I think, I think what this is is kind of the cart before the horse, right? Yeah. Because th right now we can't buy genetically modified salmon. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, they're, they're wanting everybody to ban it before it could ever you know, come out there and be a food source. Um, so you know, I don't, I don't. It's, I don't know. To me, it's kind of a, kind of a weird story because it's like we want to stop everybody from doing this. You know, it'll be interesting to see what direction Walmart goes with it. You know, if, if they're going to kind of jump on the bandwagon with some others, or just kind of wait and see how America feels about it. You know, okay. even with some of these GMO things and the non-GMO things. I mean, it's kind of that same thing. You know, kind of wait and see what's happening with it. I'll give you an example that would be interesting where GMO modification might be good. Is these are bioconcentrators, these fish. They concentrate heavy metals right. like mercury. If they're able to some way gen genetically modify the fish to where that's last, less uh, possible of happening, mm. it right. could be a good advantage. So it's not all bad. Genetic modification is not always a bad thing. And I always look at some of these things too. East Coast, West Coast. Right. They care so much about all this stuff. But that's not really where Walmart is. No, they're Central America, Middle America. Middle rather. America. I mean, this, you know, do, do these people even care about this? You know, I mean, it's, it, but that's really where their customers are, you know, that's and that's true. why I think Walmart, well, you I know, think a lot of times they're the last ones to kind of look at some of these things because it just, it, you know, I think the just one, and the, the biggest thing that, that you often hear with fish is the mercury content. Right. Yeah. And so, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a lose at all for anybody if they can somehow get some of the mercury out and these fish can, can stay away from that. Um, Let's go on to Costco because Costco announced this week that they're really going to go after the millennials, not in terms of pack size, but in terms of product assortment and product and what they're offering. Organics, which we just talked about, Jeff, 
Is this a good move for Target or for uh, Costco? I think it's I think it's a good move. I think it's a good move. Speaking to that millennial group, it's got the purchasing power. A lot of times they don't have the other attachments. They've got more discretionary income. I think it's a good idea. And I think that the millennials are really interested in things that are cause driven. They're organic. They're natural. It's probably a really good move. How you get it to them, given that they live in urban, densely right. populated yeah. areas, is going to be the real tricky part of that question. Well, that's what we think. I mean, you know, you you've got to find a way to draw them into the stores, right. into the exactly. clubs, and. You're not going to do that with bulk Tide and with bulk, you know, other products. You've got to do that with the things that they're interested in. And you know, I think the millennials will buy the bulk organics and the bulk healthy, you know, type offerings mm -hmm. that are out there, and and will give them an advantage because they can get a great price, you know. And then along with that, they'll buy some other things while they're at the store because you know Costco is a great place to shop at as far as finding you know little treasures and different things that are in the stores. So do, do you foresee Sam's and Walmart moving to something like this? Because Walmart, both of them, have, all of three of these companies really have struggled with those millennials. So. Is this kind of the, the first stone, and are we going to see the others follow? It's, it's going to be real interesting to see how that sorts out. Costco cites their stores in places where they get to a higher income graphic, uh, demographic versus Sam's, which is looking for small business and whatnot. That's historically been the case. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I think okay. how you get to that next group of consumers is a real tricky question. Yeah. Last mile delivery in an efficient way would be a, a cool start. All right, and we are out of time. Guys, thank you very much. Stay tuned. When we come back, we'll talk with Teresa Warren from Ethan Walton. All when Saturday morning meeting continues. Bentonville Plaza, across the street from the Walmart home office. The best office location for businesses working with the world's largest retailer. Bentonville Plaza offers proximity and services like no other business complex in the area, including custom designed suites and an on-site fitness center and restaurant. Pre-leasing opportunities are currently available for new construction. Call 479-200-1112 today. Discover our revolutionary lotion-infused body wash, New Dial Vitamin Boost, and wrap your skin in nourishing softness. For healthy, soft skin, people will notice. Dial, healthier skin, healthier you. K-Stack, the leader in collaborative retail consolidation programs. We offer the supply chain expertise needed to navigate the challenges of selling products with the world's largest retailers. And we provide customers with a customizable, scalable, environmentally sustainable supply chain with the same advanced technology typically used by larger rivals. By leveling the playing field, K-Stack lowers distribution costs and increases overall margins. K-Stack, retail logistics is what we do. The Northwest Arkansas Children's Shelter Starlight Gala just got squared. Hot country couple Thompson Square will light up the John Q. Hammond Center Saturday, April 26th. It's a night of elegance, entertainment, and hope for abused kids to the power of two with amazing live and silent auctions and a chance to give abused kids hope for a better life. For sponsorship and ticket information, visit our website today. Be there April 26th and get squared with KNWA and Fox 24. Most people have little time for training, and so 8th and Walton is a perfect opportunity to send your new employees to understand the retailing system. And again, because trainers were suppliers, they know the how and the why, so they become very valuable very quickly. And welcome back to Saturday Morning Meeting. Joined now by Teresa Warren. Teresa is a facilitator here at 8th and Walton, and you <laughs> came out of Walmart, you spent many years there. When did you first start with Walmart? I started with Walmart when I was a sophomore in high school, so I was a kid. And you went through, you saw a lot of things happen there, including the implementation of Retail Inc. And something that, that I think is interesting, because I've had this question a lot from different suppliers, why fuzzy dates? <laughs> a lot of questions you just mentioned. <laughs> um, back when I started with the company back in 1979, there were about 274 stores in 27 states. And uh, so Walmart has grown, grown tremendously now to very close to almost over 10,000 stores now worldwide. So I've seen tremendous amounts. So I literally kind of grew up in the company. Um, with regard to Retail Inc., um, many years ago, the way that the buyer managed the system is they didn't have Retail Link when I first went into merchandising. You basically managed your business based off of a stack of papers that was delivered to you every morning. So when they created Retail Link back in those days, uh, they really, there wasn't a third party that they could hire to come in and build it, so they hired programmers 
to build Retail Inc. And what they did is they brought in a group of individuals that were known as subject matter experts that were in merchandising, and I happened to have been one of those individuals. And they literally sat down with us and picked our brains of what we needed to manage the business, and they literally built Retail Inc. from that. And that was probably in the late 80s, possibly maybe close to 1990, somewhere in there, that they built this. And the first system was known as BDSS. But in those discussions, when they created some of the things, there were a lot of discussions that came up. And one of the buyers happened to mention, he says, well, you know, we don't want to spend a lot of time every single week coming up with having to get in here and maintain this and run queries every week right. to have to build them from scratch. Is there some way that we could automate this? And um, so we did some brainstorming and, and they said, well, what would it be? So we came up with these ideas of last week, last four weeks, last 13 weeks, year to date. So it would constantly be a moving, moving target. A moving target, but it would be stagnant dates. And so they asked us, they said, well, what would you call this? And this particular individual who still works at Walmart actually <laughs> was sitting there <laughs> and he just said, well, I don't know, call it Fuzzy Dates or something and just threw it out there and that name stuck. And that's where Fuzzy Dates came from. Interesting. Well, really what we're going to talk about today was supplier scorecard because a lot of questions come from about supplier scorecard. What should I be looking at as a supplier? Um, what, what does it tell me? Why, why should I care about this? So what are some key things that as a supplier, when I look at my scorecard, that I really should be concerned with? Um, the scorecard is, and one of the reasons that it's so important that suppliers use that, is first of all, if as a supplier you want to grow your business, you want to uh, not just be where you're at today, but you want to add incremental SKUs, you want incremental distribution, what you would need to do is become a partner with Walmart in the process. And by doing that, it's really taking an ownership in your business results to grow your business results. And the supplier performance scorecard, the reason why this is so important, it is a one-page document that has every component on it that's important to the buyer. So when the buyer looks at your business, and you don't have to be an expert to run it. It is just a one-page document, super easy to run. Anyone can run it. A buyer can pull that five minutes before walking into a supplier meeting, and very frequently does actually pull that. They can pull it for your business as a supplier, as well as their category or their department. Which I think, I think that's something that is very important for suppliers to understand because as I've talked with other suppliers who, have, who are across multiple departments, they oftentimes go and pull it by their supplier number, mm -hmm. which is very different information than what a buyer has for a specific department. So let's talk, I want you to talk a little bit about that. And why, is, why would they do that? How would they do that? to pull it by supplier number. They actually could pull it by supplier number to actually look at their particular supplier number results. They could also pull a supplier performance scorecard for a particular category. So if they're in more than one category, they could do that. Or they could pull a supplier performance scorecard for their entire business results. So there's a lot of different filters that they can do that. Now, why would they do that? They would actually be doing that because they're wanting to get into it to really understand where are your opportunities. So the main thing is your supplier performance scorecard has all of these different time periods on it. So as a supplier, what the buyer does when they pull that scorecard is they look at it to see what are the outliers? What are the things that jump out over time periods? And then they would pick those things to talk about those. So as you got walk into a supplier meeting, if you have not pulled your supplier performance scorecard, you could be caught off guard. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Teresa Warren on supplier scorecard as Saturday morning meeting continues. Imagine what it would be like if you knew the weather up to a year in advance. What would you do differently for your business or your life? At Weather Trends, we don't imagine it, we do it. We're a team of meteorologists, mathematicians, and business weather advisors. And we've spent the last 20 years developing a new way to forecast months in advance. We've been studying weather's effect on product sales based on every one degree change in temperature. We can now take your sales data 
and show you exactly how the weather impacts your business down to a single degree. We're leading the way into a new era in forecasting and a new power in business decisions. And we invite you to join us. Welcome to Weather Trends. I would recommend Ethan Walton to other suppliers because from my experience talking to other suppliers, they were even learning new ideas or just new and better business practices. Most people have little time for training, and so 8th and Walton is a perfect opportunity to send your new employees to understand the retailing system. And again, because trainers were suppliers, they know the how and the why, so they become very valuable very quickly. Beaver Lake serves as the drinking water source for one in seven Arkansans. Did you know that your actions can impact the quality of water in Beaver Lake? The Beaver Watershed Alliance is working to proactively protect, enhance, and sustain the water quality of Beaver Lake. With the help of partners, volunteers, and people like you, the Alliance is making a difference in Northwest Arkansas. Please learn more about your role in preserving the water quality of the Beaver Watershed and about how you can get actively involved. Visit BeaverWatershedAlliance.org. Beaver Watershed, our environment, our health, our home. Are you a single parent struggling to meet your family's needs? Single Parent Scholarship Fund is here to help. Single Parent Scholarship Fund of Northwest Arkansas helps hundreds of single parents get an education. By providing scholarships and support, a brighter future is right around the corner for you and your family. I'm Andrea. I'm a 2011 UA graduate with a degree in elementary education. Single Parent Scholarship Fund made that possible. My son Jaden is proud of his mama and it's inspired him to do well in school. And welcome back to Saturday Morning Meeting. Continue our conversation with Teresa Warren, and we're talking about supplier performance scorecards. What are some key areas as a supplier that I really need to focus on? As a supplier, the main things that you want to focus on are the things that are important to a buyer. So when I worked for Walmart, obviously there were certain things that were on my annual review every year. Those were sales, profit, and inventory management. Those were the things that I was held accountable to every year. So those are the hot buttons that the buyer is going to be focused on as they're managing your business. And they're going to be challenging you if you have opportunities on those. So obviously when you're growing your sales, you want to grow your sales overall, but you also want to look at your comp sales growth. So what is your same store sales or is your growth because it's organic or is it because you're in incremental distribution? Those are things that you need to be thinking about. From the profitability perspective, this is actually speaking to Walmart's profitability, not a supplier's profitability. Right. So from the profitability perspective, Walmart wants to know, are they becoming more profitable with you? So typically what you want to do, yes, you do want to look at your profit dollars this year over last year and your sales dollars this year over last year. But what's really important is that you look at your profit percent to sales so that you know, as you, are you growing your profit at the same rate or better than your sales? And typically you do want to grow that profit at a faster rate than sales. One of the things that I, that I hear a lot from uh, having been a Walmart myself is inventory should grow at half the rate of sales. Now, that's a good rule of thumb. Definitely. That's not always the case. Seasonal suppliers, for example, let's talk, you know, let's talk about that. <clears throat> you obviously, when you're looking at your inventory management or your gym Roy, you have to use common sense. So example, if I am getting ready to go into back to school or I'm getting ready to go into a major holiday like Christmas or Thanksgiving, you're going to be flowing in incremental inventory. So as you're flowing in this incremental inventory, you're going to build up your inventory prior to your sales. Right. But there should also be an expectation, and as a supplier, you should understand, what is that expectation on sell-through, and what are those weeks of supply goals? And how are you doing on your turns? And do you as a supplier know what those hot buttons are with the buyer? You mentioned turns. How important is that? Uh, for, I mean, how important is it for buyers to really look at that and for suppliers to truly understand that? I think it's going to become more and more important, especially this year. When you think about what has gone on with Walmart the last two or three years, and this is my personal perspective, but also if you listen to what the executives are saying in the earnings releases, you're hearing a lot more emphasis on inventory and inventory management, reducing costs. So what has happened is Walmart has gone back over the last two years and added incremental inventory. 
so that they could gain that customer loyalty. So now the emphasis, okay, how do you make sure you're being efficient in that and that you're turning your product and that you have the right inventory level. So you don't want to be out of stock. You want to be smart about how you're managing it. But you also want to make sure you don't have excessive inventory out there as well. Key metric on the scorecard is a general, and I know in my ex experience in, in calling on buyers, they, they typically will start sales, they go down inventory, they go down to markdowns. They seem to always wind up on Jim Roy and, and talking with different suppliers. Some of them don't quite understand that. Can you explain that? Yes, Jim Roy, <laughs> and this is a question sometimes suppliers do have. Jim Roy is really gross margin return on inventory investment. So Jim Roy is really about looking at the efficiency. So if Walmart's looking at their investment in your inventory as a supplier, how are, is that investment? So is Walmart, is that paying off for Walmart? So typically what I tell most suppliers is obviously your Jim Roy is going to look off if you're bringing in incremental inventory before a major event. Right. But typically over time it should be fairly consistent. And if you are taking an active role in managing your inventory levels, in managing the profitability getting in and examining where your markdowns are coming from, monitoring those, then that will solve any questions that could come up on Jimroy. Okay, and if somebody wants to know more about supplier scorecards, how can they find out about that? We have a class, Understanding the Supplier Performance Scorecard, which is about a three and a half hour class, and it gets into, not, it, yes, it does get into the math of the Supplier Performance Scorecard, but it also gets into factors. So what are some of the key factors that can influence each of those numbers on the supplier performance scorecard? And there's also discussions on best practices on that as well. All right, Teresa Warren, thank you very much with Ethan Walton. Stay tuned because we will continue a Saturday morning meeting coming up. GigWalk is an on-demand mobile workforce that can collect data and do work at retail. Businesses use GigWalk for retail audits, merchandising, and much more. With 350,000 smartphone-enabled workers available on demand, you get unprecedented speed and coverage across the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. And all work is reviewed for quality and accuracy. Visit GigWalk.com to learn more. Experience the unique cooling sensation of frozen yogurt. New Dial Frozen Yogurt Body Wash. Wrap your skin in cooling moisture. For skin so refreshingly soft, people will notice. Dial. Healthier skin, healthier you. The Northwest Arkansas Children's Shelter Starlight Gala just got squared. Hot country couple Thompson Square will light up the John Q. Hammond Center Saturday, April 26th. It's a night of elegance, entertainment, and hope for abused kids to the power of two with amazing live and silent auctions and a chance to give abused kids hope for a better life. For sponsorship and ticket information, visit our website today. Be there April 26th and get square with KNWA and Fox 24. Are you a single parent struggling to meet your family's needs? Single Parent Scholarship Fund is here to help. Single Parent Scholarship Fund of Northwest Arkansas helps hundreds of single parents get an education. By providing scholarships and support, a brighter future is right around the corner for you and your family. I'm Andrea. I'm a 2011 UA graduate with a degree in elementary education. Single Parent Scholarship Fund made that possible. My son Jaden is proud of his mama and it's inspired him to do well in school. I would recommend Ethan Walton to other suppliers because from my experience talking to other suppliers, they were even learning new ideas or just new and better business practices. Most people have little time for training and so Ethan Walton is a perfect opportunity to send your new employees to understand the retailing system and again because trainers were suppliers, they know the how and the why so they become very valuable very quickly. Welcome back to Saturday Morning Meeting and a special announcement for suppliers. Ethan Walton along with the Harvest Group have developed a supplier survey that seeks to bring new and meaningful insights to suppliers. These brief surveys will be emailed to select suppliers starting on March 16th. Responses will be treated as highly confidential. Everyone who responds will be invited to a June walkthrough of the results. To be certain that you receive a survey, please go to Saturday at EthanWalton.com and send us your request. 
Next week, our featured guests will be Henry Ho of Field Agent. And our thanks to Teresa Warren and today's panelists. As always, we appreciate you taking the time to join us. I'm Derek Ridenour, and from all of us at Saturday Morning Meeting, thanks for watching. We look forward to seeing you next Saturday.